All right, we are recording. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Chuck Trella here, the sort of, I guess, the instigator, if you will, of Rise Up and Carve. Um, we started Rise Up and Carve uh, about just about coming up on two years ago in February, and we're really excited to see that so many people, it's grown so much, and we've got so many people from all over the world joining in. Today, we are running a special session with our guest, Lydia Latham, and we are very excited to have her with us. She has offered up the most recent uh, spoon template, which is available up on riseupandcarve.com. It is Ruax Spoon Challenge 13, and this is based on a traditional uh, Welsh dolphin spoon form that Lydia has made her own. And she also very generously offered us this sort of designed cull rosing pattern uh, for the handle of the spoon, if we wish to use that. And today she's offered to do a demo of how her, her coal rosing techniques and uh, to, you know, just sort of help talk us through it so that for those who aren't familiar with coal rosing, she can let us know what that's all about and she can show us how it's done. So welcome everyone once again. I, again, just for uh, purposes here to keep everybody on the same page, keep yourselves muted unless you have a question to ask. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, and I guess that's it. So Lydia, take it away. I will spotlight your um, hands okay. one, yeah. <laughs> okay, fab. So um, I thought I'd just very quickly begin with tools because um, that's something I get asked a lot about. Um, so I have a selection here um they're all ones i have used and do use um and then i'll go into more detail about uh, the one that i use more uh regularly now so this is the first col rosing tool i got it is um a very traditional um tool and it's um very similar to a nail a flattened flattened nail essentially so you've got your round tang with the beveled edges on either side and the angle. Now, the way that you use this tool um, is a pushing technique. So you would put the tip of the blade into the, into the wood and you'd use your back thumb and you would angle um, and push the blade up through the wood like this. And so you're pushing away from yourself. Um, I started with this um, and it's not a bad technique um, by any stretch of the imagination. It just wasn't comfortable for me. Um, I found I didn't have enough control. I found the blade slipped out. Um, and if I'm using um, a piece of wood that has got a lot of different um, grain uh, hardness in it, um, it would kind of stutter and jump if I went over a piece that was particularly hard and then I'd get a lot of kind of slip outs. So this knife uh, is not one I use uh, regularly anymore, but I always take it with me because some people prefer to use a push knife technique. Um, this is the same. This is a P file um, and it's just a straight, a straight angled blade. Uh, and I use this in exactly the same way uh, for pushing. Um, but this one you can actually use as a pen as well. But I found the angle on this blade not it, not to be kind of very forgiving. So it's very easy to make a mistake and it's very easy to take the nib off because the nib is incredibly thin. I don't know if you can see that. The tip of the blade is very, very thin. Um, I met uh, Sam Cooper in... Uh, London a few years ago at a Carve London event and he was coal rosing with his Mora 106 and uh, the way that he did that was he t he would hold he would hold the Mora like a pen and he would coal rose like that but as you can see my little hands means that the blade rests in the um this section of my of my hand um, and it just it feels very dangerous and it feels like I'm going to cut myself. So I did tape the top of my Mora um, 
and um and used it that way so I was just essentially using the the bottom half this is one of my teaching knives so it's lost its <laughs> it has actually lost its end but ordinarily you'd be able to use a Mora 106 and just take that off if you have any problems okay the uh, next knife is a chip carving knife which I got from uh, Nick Westerman and this works beautifully um, but again it's got a very straight angle here um, and I find that to be very unforgiving when you're doing any kind of turning um, cuts or any rotation cuts but as you can see this blade is a lot thicker at the back which does mean that when you do part the grain it creates a really lovely um, gap for you to fill with any um, pigments that you're using. Um, finally, this is the knife that I use all the time. I have several of these because these are what I use for teaching coal rosing. Um, and it is a Ben Orford knife. Um, it's got a really nice short blade, a really nice fat blade as well. And it's quite wide all the way down to the tip. Uh, so when you're using this to part the grain, it creates a really lovely big channel for the cinnamon to sink into. And if you're finding that when you're doing coal rosing, you're getting a very faint, thin line, it's possibly that the knife you're using, the tip is way too thin. Um, and it's possibly causing like a really narrow channel, like a fine line, a pen. Um, so what you can do is you can either angle your blade further up. So when you're putting it in, in the wood, you can angle it further up so that you are making sure you are putting the thicker part of the blade through the wood um, or use a, you sharpen your knife so that you do end up using a much fatter back to the blade. So I grip it like a pen. So my finger and my thumb on either side. And it means that I can pull the knife towards myself and, and essentially draw with the knife, um, uh, which, it, which I'll show you when I get started. Uh, the uh, last tool can that I, I want to- Can a question? Is, yeah, yeah, go for it. Do you, have, do you find you have to sharpen your blade fairly frequently or not so much because you're not no, actually cutting no. wood? Very, very rarely do I have to sharpen and I found I have to be really careful when I'm doing the sharpening because you don't want to ruin the angle of the blade itself. It's only like a mil to two mil that's going to be actually in the wood itself. Um, so like you say, it's not actually bluntening the knives that much. My new batch that I've just got for teaching, obviously they've not been used much this year because there's not been that much teaching and stuff going on, but they haven't even been sharpened. They haven't been touched. They oh. just stored. Um, the last one I'm going to show you seems a bit weird, but it's a compass, um, a compass or a pit or a nail or a screw um, for creating like the dots in the centers of flowers or if I'm making a border or the kind of seed heads at the top of a grass or something like that. This is a really cool uh, tool for just creating texture and creating perfect circles and perfect dots. So like when I do the eye of the bird, I'll use this um, and, it, and, it, and it just creates a really good perfect circle without you having to twist the blade in the wood or anything like that. So the template that I made for the Rise Up and Carve um, challenge was very much based on um, this spoon. Um, it's not the one I'm going to be coal rosing today. I'm going to be coal rosing a, a cherry spoon that I have made, which is similar, but not quite the same. But I thought I'd just show you this um, so you can see what was uh, intended by like the dimensions of the, of the um, template, as it were. So I facet the back so that you get the, the ridges running down so that you end up with a really nice narrow neck, but then the nice thick dolphin hump here. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> I'm kind of guiding myself by watching another screen, but yeah. So Sorry, you can, you, can you say show the tool again where you do the circles? Or do you show yeah, that just, anyway? Um, it's just a primary school compass. Yeah, and um, so you, you, you just, do the circles with the round tip. 
Yeah, I just use it as kind of a stabbing tool. Um, I will be using it in a bit when I do, when I start the call rosing. So I'll show you then. So like okay, when okay, I'm okay. going to be doing the eye of the bird or the center of the flower here, um, I'll yeah. just use this to make little pin pricks and it'll just make a really nice little dot work patterning. The other thing- okay, got it, um, got it. Sorry. It, yeah. I wouldn't be afraid of like testing lots of different things. I've seen people using like the sides of screws and pressing those into the wood because then you get like these little concentric lines and things. Um, so yeah, playing with playing with unusual materials to make patterns is quite is quite fun. Um, so I've already drawn my design on here. Um, it is different from the one that I submitted on the or suggested on the on the design but that's just because this piece of cherry has such a lovely piece of grain that goes up here and I wanted to kind of use that almost as a branch so I've got little leaves that are coming off the off the grain there like that and nice. some flowers up the side there we go so when I'm when I'm starting um, I just freehand draw, I don't trace anything um, because I, I tend to design something in a sketchbook and then I will just kind of slot it and fit it into the spoon. Um, I tend to start somewhere at the bottom because I find my hand can rub away the graphite um, and you want to kind of keep an eye on that and maybe top it up if there's anything that's kind of rubbing off at any point. Um, so I'm going to start down here on the bird. Is that zoomed in enough or would you like it more zoomed in? I, I, I could come in maybe just a little bit more. Yeah, I think that looks good. Or the, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Okay. So I'm going to start by doing this this little sweep down the bird here. So this bit I'm going to do all in in one pull motion, um, without without raising my knife off the off the wood if I can. Um, so I'll start at the top of the head. Um, I'm just bring my bring my knife down. You can stop if you feel, if you if you get to a point where you need to turn, you can stop and just rearrange your hand. Um, I'm kind of twisting the knife slightly, but not um, putting too much strain on the blade whilst it's in the wood, because that's when you snap the nib and lose the nib into your wood. Um, and it's kind of a combination of twisting the twisting the wood and twisting the and moving the knife you're kind of moving your drawing surface and moving the knife at the same time so you can see that there's a a cut that's gone all the way down there now um so for doing the top of the head i'm going to start at the beak it's very similar to how i would draw really actually um and then just join those two those two lines up you can bring your knife out and put it back in, but make sure you're putting it back in where where you left off, if that makes sense. Um, and that's how I make my tight curves. So doing the beak, the beak's quite easy because it's just a, a singular, uh, a little short line. So you can put the knife in at the tip of the beak and you can just roll the knife back slightly and that creates enough of a line so you don't even have to you don't even have to pull the blade you can just put the tip of the knife into the tip of the of the beak um, and just roll roll the blade back slightly i have a question yeah um, how deep do you cut how deep um i mean it depends on the wood that you're carving with Cherry is quite nice and um, soft, but so the blade probably goes in about about that much. Oh, okay. It's very small, very very small, and that's why this knife is so good because you can you see that when I tilt it yeah. to the side, even if you're only just putting the the nib where my thumbnail is, you're still getting quite a thick piece of blade going into the wood, so it is properly parting, is properly separating the grain of the wood. 
Okay, thank you. Without having to do too much angling of the blade to kind of wiggle it to get the thick part in. So this part of the neck here is quite a tight curve. Um, and the way that I would uh, kind of tackle that is um, similar to the beak, um, putting the knife in and, and rolling the blade. And I take the blade out, move the wood, and then do a single stab, turn it and do another single stab. And can you see what that's done is kind of almost like a, a dot to dot at the neck. Where you've got like the um, individual knife kind of stabs almost. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you're picking it up and turning it slightly each time to get around that corner. Exactly, exactly. So picking it up, putting the knife in, picking it up and putting the knife in again. So then when I get to this section here, this can be all one curve, one knife cut again, similar similar to this section here. So this bit I'm going to do all as one singular pull with the blade. It takes, um, it, it took me a fair amount of um, practice to do tight curves because you have to make sure you're putting the knife back in where you lifted it out, if, um, uh, if that makes sense. You have to make sure you're joining your dots, otherwise you do end up with a gappy line. Um, um, but that just, that just uh, comes with, with practice. Trying to make it so it'll focus. There we go. So this section here um, is all the kind of uh, wing feathers. And this I could do in a number of ways. Um, you can do it kind of like in a stabbing technique if you want very textured wings, um, or if you want the individual feathers. Um, I will do the down strokes first, separating each individual feather, and then I'll do the kind of cross um, cuts afterwards, which are the base of the feather. So the first cuts I do are like I like that. So they're like repetitive down cuts. And then what I do is I then join these cuts to the previous cut um, in, a, in, a, in a similar way to the way I did this curve here. So I just do a little, a little stab like that. There we go. So you can see the little feathers have kind of joined up. In my earlier Col Rosings, I was doing kind of detailed lines up the feathers then. But what I found was um, I was severing far too many of the of the wood's grain, too much of the wood's grain. And then I'd get little chunks that would just pop out like chip carving. And that's just not what I was what I was going mm. for. So I'm going to use that same technique that I used for the feathers here to do the tail feathers. So it's uh, straight lines between the, the feathers. And then joining those feathers up to each other. You do this so quickly and easily. It's almost like you've done a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, well, it was um, it was one of those things that I'd never seen before. I went to um, one of the Bodger's balls, maybe like I don't know, eight years ago or something. It's when I first got this one, and um, my mother-in-law actually bought me this tool um, and showed me the coal rosing because I was doing a lot of illustration and kind of tattoo design and um, and my art foundation and things like that and. Uh, she thought it would be a really good way for me to transition my drawing onto into my spoon carving and it yeah it very much stuck I think 
Yeah, no, it, it, it uh, it's, you've done a brilliant job making that transition. <laughs> I find it really fun. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is the little, um, like texture feathers. So this bird is kind of, I don't know, kind of a, it's a little bit like a, a thrush that you'd get in the UK is kind of the shape I was going for. So the speckled chest um, mm. is, it works really well with this. And the way that I do that is making sure the blade is at, is that 90 degrees that way? Yeah, 90 degrees to the wood face and literally just stabbing into the wood without moving the blade at all. Um, if I'm moving in any direction, it would be back slightly. And what that does is it creates um, almost like a triangle where mm. you get a really nice thick, triangly kind of teardrop. Um, and it just creates a really nice like um, speckly texture for the, for the bird's chest feathers. Um, and you can use this for like uh, fern textures or leaf textures. Um, I've got an, a really lovely Adam Hawker spoon where he's used this um, in the kind in the grass. I think they're grasses or foxgloves. The textures there. There we go. So we've got little little speckly dots all down his little chest now. Nice. So for his legs, they're just little straight lines. So I'll just do those like a single pull. And then for his eye, I will use the compass. So this, I, I, I have used nails before, but the compass I think is works really well because it is so sharp and so quite still quite small. There we go. That's the bird. Nice. The good the good thing about Col Rosing is um, if you work in directional light. So uh, this shows up really well on my camera, but in real life, it's not great for me to see because I've got overhead lighting. But if I'm doing this, mm. um, if I'm trying to work really cleanly, um, like I'm doing, if I'm doing a, I don't know, a spoon for like a specific competition or something like that, then I'll work with like a desk light. Um, yeah. and I find that makes it really easy for me to see the, di the, the cuts because of the directional, the directional lighting. I, have a, I find that I have a really hard time because my hand is like in the way, like, like where I'm grit, like I can't see around my fingers. <laughs> you yeah, know that's what I mean? Point, actually. Um, I don't know can I, I i don't know now if i can see or not i i think i just do it second nature um let me have a look um yeah i can't see where i'm going if that makes sense okay yeah so i think it's like muscle memory from when i drew the image yeah maybe um hey, and hey, also if you if you um i don't know if you can see me on my other camera yes. at the top but like I, I, I do kind of sit with my head tilted to one side and okay. <laughs> look it's around. Interesting though, I, speaking of the light, like sometimes I find I can't even see the like the lines that I've made either because I wasn't making a thick enough or a heavy enough line. And I have a, I, I have like one of these like rolling stand ring lights that I use. Um, and I find that actually the ring light is not good. Like you want more yeah. of a pinpoint light because like you said, this is so even and diffuse that you're not getting strong shadows. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it, positioning the angled light kind of low so that yeah. it's kind of shining across the wood is quite good because then you can see all of the little divots and grooves that you've made. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah, I find as well, the, the directional light is good, better for actually seeing the original drawing um as well depending on what you're using as a drawing tool so i've just done um one of the leaves at the side here and one of the things i really like to play with is um thickness of line so let me see if i can find a drawing to show you an example 
so this is an illustration of a tattoo design that I did. It's not like for a Cole Rosing piece or anything. Um, let me see if I can. So can you see for like the, the snail shell, for example, I use a much thicker line to define the outline and then the textural stuff that I do on the inside is with um, a much finer lined pen. So for the outside line, that's probably like a 0.3 and then the dot work inside is a 0 .0, 0.05 pen. So getting that depth by using a knife can be can be achieved by using the knife as well by angling the blade correctly. So when we're when we're doing the outline, I tend to hold my pen quite upright, quite at a 90 degrees, so that I'm getting this fat section of the blade through the wood to create a really thick line and I'm pressing um, moderately hard, I would say, so that the depth of the blade is is probably, I don't know, like I showed earlier, like that much maybe. Okay. Um, and I'm getting the back of the blade through, so I'm getting a nice thick solid line. Um, to get the texture in this leaf, if I then did the same kind of line again, you'd get the same problem that I was getting with the um, Mm. feathers in the in the bird's wing and that the wood would pop out and you'd end up with a chip carving whereas if I angle my blade so that the thinner section of the wood uh, thinner section of the blade is coming into contact with the wood what I'm doing is essentially just making like a score mark I'm not cutting deep through the the wood grain let me see focus it'll be more clear once I've done the um, cinnamon but so up this section here what I've done is I've just pressed the blade ever so slightly into the wood Got it. Um, so that I'm getting like a little scored mark and that'll just create little bits of texture like little veins of the leaf almost and so you're not like you're not cutting really deep. You're just yeah. You're just basically scoring the wood. Barely. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think you can kind of see that. So what hey, I've Lydia, done. With the, yeah. We had we had one question come in through the uh, chat. The the text. Oh yeah, chat. you be, you be oh. chat monitor for me. Yep. No problem. <laughs> do you use do you use multiple passes to get the desired width? So on your thicker lines, do you ever go back over those lines to widen them out more? Um, no, uh, the, the official answer is no, um, but this is a, a possibly a do as I say, not as I do type thing. Um, sometimes if I did do a line that wasn't thick enough, I would uh, on that very, rare occasion possibly go back through but the danger you have there is not following the same line and removing any material and the idea of coal rosing is that you're parting the grain you're essentially tattooing the surface of the wood you're parting the grain and putting a pigment in you're not actually removing anything from mm. the wood so the danger of going doing a double pass as it were is that you you would you would run kind of slightly out of the channel and remove some of the wood. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on a, I mean, I'm human, so I do make some lines which are not where I want them to be or not as thick as I want them to be. And so, yeah. <laughs> You're not Terminator Lydia machine <laughs> not, robot? I'm not, I'm not <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to work my way up these little leaves now because they're kind of rubbing off a little bit. So I do my center line of my leaf first. Um, so I'm going to do this one here. So I do, ordinarily I would have, would have col rose the stem of, oh, sorry. Ordinarily I would have col rose the stem section, but I'm using this lovely flow of the grain right. as the stem. So, um, I'm going to do this section of the leaf first and then the outside section. And I'll show you how I do these little wavy, wavy lines on there. So 
the curve of the stem is of the of the leaf is quite um is not a tight curve so i can do that in one one swoop like that and then the top line of this leaf is another um not very tight curve so i can do that in in one swoop So do you ever find that when you're doing that and you're exerting your pressure and your force to draw that knife blade along that you still, is it, have, I tend, maybe just because I'm new and I haven't yet got the muscle memory or the technique down yet, to sometimes accidentally overshoot my mark? Yeah, uh, no, that does happen, particularly if you're using, um, if you've made your spoon so the grain is running down, yes. you're going to do that a lot, whereas you want to have you want to be between between grains if, if that makes sense so like this all of this section of wood here is going to have the same resistance level you're not going to hit a piece which is going to have much more resistance and slip or hit a piece that has n much less resistance and slip if that makes sense I, it makes sense conceptually but i'm not understanding how you got the the grain oriented in the spoon to make that happen so, so because i've got the concentric rings in the bowl yeah that that will then cause this to to result in that if okay. you were going down the grain that way and you were col rosing like this surface oh, here so i have the exact wrong orientation then because, I, <laughs> because well my... it's not wrong it's just harder yeah You've it's just hard, set i guess a challenge. it's tough to see but because i'm doing a yeah, radial yeah. rather than a tra ta uh, tangential that exactly that okay so All that's right. going to cause you you are going to every dark line is going to be hard and every yeah. light section is going to be nice and soft and spongy okay Got and it. so you're gonna yeah almost hit like a stop start stop start type thing okay very good. So we want ten tangential is what we're looking for then. Yeah, for ease, but you can do it on both. It is gotcha. possible. It's just a, it just takes a lot more control. And also, I'm not taking my hand off, um, off the table. All of my um, pressure. All of the control. pull is coming from my fingers, if that makes sense. Yeah. So okay. I can only go so far. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, fast grown or slow grown versus slow grown. Uh, yeah. Uh, I found fast growing wood to be very soft and very spongy and very absorbent of pigment. If that makes sense. Oh, that's um, a, that's a good is a good question. Do you have particular species of wood that you prefer to use at all? Yes. Uh, if I can get my hands on it, apple is my favorite um because the 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 density of the wood is is soft enough that i can col rose the surface when it is partially dry um mm -hmm. but hard enough and and not porous so that you don't get any um kind of shading or pigmentation happening around so like if you're using something like ash you're going to get all these little speckly patches where the where the um, cinnamon has just been absorbed just into the wood itself, not into the into the yeah. coal rosin pattern necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's that would be. That actually a, a, a related question: Do you do any mm -hmm. surface prep before coal rosing? So, do you burnish it all, or do you oil it all before you coal rose? Uh, I do not oil um i do burnish um and my the carving knife i use is um a blade similar to the mora but it is a nick westerman one and what i do is i just make sure that i'm trying to make it so you can see i make sure that this surface is a single knife slice if that makes sense okay so that so section is, is beautifully flat to my okay. blade so again, unlike mine, where it does a saddle like curvature going this way. <laughs> you can, so no, no, you can do that. It's just for if I'm teaching like beginners yeah. or um, if I'm prepping for a, a class, then I will make sure that that surface is flat because otherwise it's just added 
it just added, makes it that um, much harder yeah yeah exactly and you're gonna because gravity is playing against you isn't it it's gonna make you slip down the sides yeah um, okay hey, Lydia yeah I thought that first um layer of cured oil kind of protected the the wood around the drawing from absorbing any pigment so if you're not uh, oiling first are there other tricks is that what I guess the burnishing does or is it like yeah so I have I've tried oiling, um, but I found that when I made a cut, I mean, maybe maybe you have to leave it to dry or something, but what I found that when I made a cut, the wood would just go like kind of slowly sponge itself back together, if that makes oh. sense. So I found having unoiled but burnished, so the burnishing flattens all of the other grain down, um, so you don't get any kind of fluffy surface. But the the fact that it's dry means that it's not going to kind of back together once you've made a cut, if that makes sense. But I mean, I, I I'm very I haven't done a course in coal rosing. Uh, this is um, watching Zed Outdoors and Adam Hawker videos online and practice like playing. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if you're not getting hard, if you're not getting powdery dust around your drawing, it must be working. So I'm interested to yeah. see oiling technique later, or your, the technique where you add the pigment later. So that's yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'll see how far I get, but I might just do a bit of pigment in a bit so that you can see. Um, so this, I'll do this line here so you can see some tight curves. Um, so similarly to this part of the neck, I'm going to bring the the knife out and do like a, a slight stab and turn the spoon around. But again, making sure that when I put the knife back in the, in the wood, I'm putting it back in where I started. That almost looks like a mouth, actually, that one. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um so i don't know if you want me to just um kind of plod along and i'll just call rose the rest of this and you can ask me questions as and when i get to a bit that you want answers on or sure and then i can get to the bit where i can rub some pigment in for you does anybody have any questions that they'd like to jump in and ask uh, my question is a little bit more just about um, for people who are wanting to learn how to draw. I love your naturalist sketches. And I recently picked up a book from John Muir Law, who does a lot of birds and plants. And I was just wondering if you had any tips for people who are trying to improve their sketching technique or wanting to learn how to do kind of the flora and fauna sketches that you do. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things the biggest hurdles I had when I first started drawing. Um, so I did an art foundation at college mm. after my A-levels, and then I did an art degree um, in, in embroidery and textiles and weaving. Um, and one of the things I learned on my art foundation, which I've taken with me to basically, I don't know, everything that I do creatively is to not be precious. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sorry, I've just realized my laptop's running out of battery, so I'm just plugging that in. Um, so having a sketchbook that isn't like an immaculate thing that you're gonna frame, mm -hmm. having a sketchbook that you're not worried about making dirty or you know, dropping it in a muddy puddle or things like that, so that you've got this thing that you can draw in whenever you wanna draw. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being able to practice when you feel like practicing. Um, I did a, I did a bit of a challenge when I, um, when I was, it might have been like, I don't know, about five years ago or something. I went through a bit of a rough patch and one of the things my boyfriend got me to do was he said like, you should do a drawing every day because I've noticed you're really miserable when you don't do something creative. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a sketchbook and I literally just drew in, drew a picture once every day. And some days it would literally just be like, a scratchy line on a page but that counted that was that was me making a mark that day um so yeah I think I think it's just yeah not not trying to draw like somebody else draw like yourself 
draw how it feels comfortable for you. Um, I mean, I do copy other people's drawings to try and learn technique the same like I do. Um, if I buy a particularly lovely spoon, then I will do copies of that spoon to try and learn how they've carved it. Similar to the spoon challenge, really. You know, you're taking somebody right. else's work and you're trying to replicate it so you can understand how to make the tools do what you want them to do. Um, but yeah, same applies to drawing, really. I think. Excellent. One other question that came in uh, from Jody over the chat. Do you let the wood dry before you're decorating? So, and if so, how much? Uh, yes, uh, and it varies. So, um, depends on how wet the wood is. Um, I have kind of, I mean, so I haven't done any carving in a long time um, because I've, I'm, I'm pregnant and moving house and my body isn't feeling great. So <laughs> I haven't done any actual physical spoon carving in a, in a while, <laughs> but um, I normally have kind of a, a, a set carving process where I will ax out blanks in the morning. So if I'm batch making for like a, a festival or an event or something, I will ax all the blanks out in the morning and then I work in like the roughing knife stage on the set of blanks that I did like the previous day or a few days ago. And then the next morning I'll knife finish the ones which are from like a few days ago. And then they will then get col rosed probably the end of the week. So maybe a week. Okay. And, it, and you don't, do you put your, your um, blanks in like plastic between or at all? Or are they always, once, once you've roughed them out and you've started carving them, they're always just out in the air? Um, because I carve quickly they're yeah. out they're just done okay. um if i'm like now from now onwards what is likely to happen is they're going to be bagged because i'm not going to have time to like right. batch make in the same way um right. but i've never used like the freezer or anything like that i used to use the fridge um but i used the freezer once and all of the wood i got for all of the spoons i got from that shattered completely hmm. like they didn't even split they just shattered completely and i don't know if it's wow. because i thawed them too quickly or if the wood was particularly splitty anyway but it, it just it wasn't a process that agreed with me so i just never did it again i have had them in the fridge though that's happened did i hear you say earlier that there's coal rosing competitions i'm wondering what those are like Oh yeah, there are. Um, well, it's not a specific coal rosing competition. It's um, at the Bodgers Ball. Um, there are spoon carving competitions. So there's a knife finished category and a sanded finished category. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I enter those categories. <laughs> I haven't won yet. <laughs> I will, I'm hoping one day to to clinch that that would be really cool i was totally picturing one of those high stress competitions like the cake competitions you see on television i think that would be uh, hilarious to watch green like speed, coal speed coal rosing yeah like high pressure where there's judges yelling at you that you only have two minutes left that'd be great yeah well i don't know maybe next year at the spoon hooli or something <laughs> in between the caber toss and the <laughs> yeah <laughs> It would draw a crowd, that'd be fun. I mean, there would need to be uh, medics on hand, I think, for that one. Right, sure. right, speed and edged, edged tools. Yeah, so, well, I guess actually there is, a, there is a competition at the Bodgers Ball, which is the, I don't know if it's like five minutes or something. You've got like a really short period of time and you can make anything. Um, and then at the end, they judge like the best thing that was made in this really short period of time. So there's like loads of pole lathers there and loads oh, yeah, of carvers nice. and willow weavers and stuff like that. So yeah, maybe a col rosed thing in a, re in a really short period of time. I could give that a go. Are there any, who, who do you admire for their col rosing? Um, I mean, the obvious answer is going to be Adam Hawker because of just the sheer precision. I mean, if you've, if you've seen his stuff online, it's it's yeah. it looks amazing. But then to see it in real life, it's the level of accuracy. I think that I really admire. I think 
when you're doing something that's very organic like this, I can hide a multitude of sins in here. Right. Because it's a curvy shape. You know, it's not it's not a set regimented um, pattern where every single piece has to be exactly the same as the previous piece. I mean, if you make a mistake in one of those basket weaves, it sits out like a sore thumb, really. Yeah. Where here, like, I mean, I have made a mistake, I can show you. Um, well, that's not a mistake, but can you see here where the tip of the leaf, I've slipped out ever so slightly into the flower shape, but I can mask that with the petal that I'm going to create in the flower. So uh, yeah, okay. So it's not the end of the world, really. And also I work in a much more sketchy way so i'm kind of working as a as a drawing as opposed to a precision right well anyway but yeah i i, I would yeah Adam it's not I'd a like mistake to... it's a design change <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a it's a choice <laughs> i would like to do um like a workshop with him though that would be really cool to just sit and be taught by him how he because he uses like per, i think it's um not perspex, but like a thick plastic to create his repetitive patterns. So he draws mm. his repetitive patterns on the surface using like a template. Yeah. Um, whereas I tried to freehand it and it just, yeah, it didn't, it didn't go well. Freehanding yeah, a basket weave wasn't. Actually good. one of our um, Rise Up and Carvers, uh, Don Elizetti, who I admire his call rosing work a lot. Um, but he, um, sells a set of spoon template, you know, design templates out of, you know, that sort of perspex, you know, plastic type thing. And he's got yeah. one, one of his set has those, you know, the parallel lines like that. Exactly. Um, which, which he sells through, uh, I think it's uh, Hewn and Hone. I don't know, at least he used to, I don't know if he still does. Oh yeah, no, I think I've seen, yeah, exactly. So that, that I think is a really cool, really cool idea. And you can use, you can use like milk bottles to make that and, yep. um, or like what, I don't know, showing that I'm a kid of the nineties now, OHP paper, <laughs> that like plastic. <laughs> yeah, plasticized paper. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I've done my leaves. Um, I'm now going to do the flower. Um, nice. Well, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm watching the one screen and trying to angle at the other. So I'm going to do the kind of texture in the middle of this flower now and then do the petals. So for the petals, I'm going to do a really thick line um, around the outside of the petals. And then I'm going to do like a thin scored line for the inside. Same again. Excellent. I think there's like a quite um I really like the simplicity of not of not having a, a spoon that is um you know decorated. I don't decorate all of my spoons, but I definitely think there is like a a group of people who really love decorated spoons and then a load of people who really don't love any decoration at all and prefer much prefer the kind of simplicity of things. I think that's really interesting. I found like when I work at um festivals and things like that when you have loads of spoons laid out it's really interesting watching which spoon people gravitate to it's really hard to predict what what spoon mm. someone's gonna like and I find that really cool it's funny I, I find for myself a lot of times I just get so enamored of the wood of the grain itself that mm. like unless it's like really plain I, I I tend to not want to try and do any sort of decorative work on it um so now 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 i'm having to think about finding wood that's relatively plain so that i can work on my cull rosing <laughs> see that kind of comes back to that idea of being precious so yeah like this i mean this wood is 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 pretty nice like nice piece of cherry there's nice detail in there it would have been fine if i'd have left it alone right um and uh, there's always the potential of ruining something if you're going to keep going um but I just, uh, yeah, I, uh, I always quite like the idea of um, if you don't try it, you're never gonna, you're never gonna. See. For those who uh, of you out there who haven't uh, either, you know, followed Lydia on Instagram, you're gonna want to do that. Um, Lydia, one of the things that I really admire 
uh, about a lot of your call rosing is how you've played around with letting your patterns overlap, like go off the edge of the spoon. So the, it's, it's like you can tell that it's this really detailed larger picture that you're only getting the spoon handled shape bit of, or conversely letting the design wrap around the handle uh, so that it comes around onto the back or the sides, which is just, I, I just think that's really cool. Yeah, it was um, that happened by accident actually. They that that the first ones I did for that were for um, the Bodges Ball um, last year. So not the spring that's just gone, the spring before, um, and it was two apple spoons that I did, um, and they had uh, wild roses on them and. The handle were handles of those were relatively narrow, but I knew I really wanted to call rows onto them. And so it was just kind of something that just, yeah, like you say, just happened. Yeah. Um both of those they sold, which I was was great, but I was quite sad to watch those go. Luckily, one of them went to a friend of mine, so I can actually still see it on occasion. Um but yeah, those are those were really cool. That's quite hard. So when you're doing a wrap around what the the difficult part is is this section here so um when you're it, when you're making any kind of cuts on the side if you're doing parallel lines it's very easy to chip carve that yeah. section and for you to get grain fallout so mm. making sure you've got plenty of uh structural integrity between the cuts you make or making the cuts on the side much more um kind of um score lines as opposed to cuts will really help yeah. with that but yeah that's a it is a challenge and it's hard as well because you've got to work out a way of holding it yeah a way of holding it without cutting yourself and also without damaging the spoon so i'm col mm. i'm colorizing now at the table i don't normally do this i normally do it on the arm of my armchair in my workshop because it's okay. a sponge surface. And I find that works because this section of the spoon just sits into the cushion. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't rock and it doesn't move as much. Um, so if you're struggling with col rosing because of the spoon like moving, um, try doing it. I mean, obviously not on the arm of a really nice chair because you're gonna slip and you're gonna stab it, but <laughs> having like a fab like felt down or something like that. So there's a bit of give that works really well. Yeah. Sorry, this is taking a lot longer than normal because I'm stopping and chatting well, to you. I was going to say, because we keep interrupting you with questions. No, no, it's <laughs> nice. It's good. it's good as well because you're forcing me to stop every now and then, which is really good for my hands. I think um, it's very easy to get absorbed into a, into mm. a cold roll that you're doing and then end up with really bad hand cramps. So just stopping and like loosening your grip every now and then is really it's good That's practice. actually a good question. Do you do any specific like hand exercises or hand stretches uh, to try and avoid repetitive stress type injury? Um, not specific, but just making sure, you know, wiggling your fingers and, yeah, yeah. and stretching here, like that kind of thing. Um, oh. I think working um, in a job, which means I type a lot, is actually mm. probably quite beneficial because the typing, <laughs> the action of touch typing actually is quite good for my for my fingers, I think. Gotcha. Which I never thought I would say that an office job is actually good for my health, but in in this instance, it's probably giving my fingers a good little stretch workout. Ah, so we do have a, another question came in from uh, Salvador in Mexico. Hey, Salvador. Um, Hi. What other pigments can you use? So you mentioned cinnamon earlier ones that you use or have used um, that you could, you know, compare and contrast with cinnamon and use on dark wood. So to go like a light pigment on a darker toned wood. I've wanted to have a play with milk paint. So um, I don't know if you guys, if some of you saw my video I did with Barn Spoon in the summer, mm. um, that was uh, before, before I, um, 
yeah before before I we were moving house and before everything went a bit chaotic so I was experimenting then with painting the surface with milk paint and then col rosing over the top col rosing and then painting milk paint over that and then I was going to start playing with using the milk paint as a pigment in itself um, mm. but I just didn't get around to that 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 was something that I kind of want to play with more in the future um, I used to use coffee but I found that that faded very quickly um, I've, I personally have just found that cinnamon works best for me um, in that it forms a really nice dark line and it's easy and it, it is accessible I mean it's in the supermarket so it's not something that's a challenge for me to get right. um, I know just, people have it's used, a wonderful smell <laughs> yeah and it smells great um, I have known people to use like charcoals or like um some yeah like burnt substances that's so yeah like a charcoal um you can use like turmeric um mm -hmm. but again the staining so maybe the oil would work quite well with that because then you could wipe away you maybe from the surface, the surface yeah like clean it but yeah hello oh i'd love a cup of tea thank you <laughs> The joy of doing wood carving in the house, your husband walks past and you can snag a cup of tea. <laughs> nice. Okay. So this section, sorry, I was just realized I was off camera. So this top section of the petal here, I'm doing the same as I did in this section and the same for these bits of the petals here. I'm taking the knife out turning the wood slightly and putting the knife back in to make that kind of wobbly uneven edge again this is a good way of like disguising mistakes so if you slip out ever so slightly it doesn't matter because you can just you know say that you're carving a chrysanthemum or something or something that's got a wiggly edged petal and that way it doesn't really matter A nice thing to do, um, I used to do quite a lot of, was um, col rosing the leaf of the tree, that the type of wood. So the idea is that you could identify the wood by the leaf that is col rosed on the handle. Nice. Yeah, that was quite cool. So Kamal, uh, I, I just want to point out, we are at the sort of coming up pretty much at the one hour mark. Um, Kamal was asking, say, he has to leave soon. He was asking if you could speak a little bit about how you apply the pigment. Yeah, what, I'm what literally, I think I'm there, actually. I was going to say, you're getting pretty close. Let me just pop this leaf on there and then I'm done. So I want to talk about pigment, actually, because um, there is a massive difference in the quality of cinnamon that you can buy in the shops. Um, so I found that something like um, an own brand supermarket um, cinnamon is not great. Um, and I'll go with me. Right. So this is cinnamon that is just from Tesco. Um, and can you see there's like yeah, bits of fibrous the bits. The husky bits. Yep. Um, and I just, it doesn't sink in. Whereas this is a Schwartz one and you can see that it's like a super fine powder yeah and it just, it just sinks in really nicely um bear with me one second i'm just gonna go and grab oil from the kitchen okay so ordinarily i would use linseed oil um, but I've packed it. So I'm going to use um, some sunflower oil from my kitchen just to show you what I've got. So let me. Do you try to remove the designs or the pencil marks before you put the cinnamon on? Um, I found literally the rubbing of the cinnamon at, uh, abrases it away anyway. So um, I used to be quite anal about it, like to get rid of all of the little marks before doing anything but um i've it I, in practice it doesn't actually need to happen so 
So you're just grabbing the powder dry and putting it on and rubbing it in? And I and I rub, make sure I'm rubbing in like little circular motions to make sure it gets in all the little the little crevices. And it, it does work with the with the cheaper um, cinnamon because that cinnamon will, uh, you know, the fine bits will sink in and the the bit, bigger bits won't sink in. It's just you're gonna have to go through a lot more cinnamon to to be able to actually get your your pattern. So. I normally use like, I've got like a set of rags as well. I don't normally use kitchen roll. I just use fabric, but make do with what we have on hand. Okay, so let me see if I can. So I'm gonna just rub in to the surface now and I've kept a lot of the cinnamon on the surface. So it's it will get mixed with the oil and make like a paste. So the towel has oil on it. Yeah. And there we go. Wow. Nice. So if you find you've got little gaps forming, even once you've oiled, you can like pick up a bit of the cinnamon on the oily cloth and that just kind of forms a paste um and sticks in there and then the very last step i do is using the back of the knife that i've used to call rose i just burnish that surface because you you'll be able to feel all these little ridges where the where you've made your cuts You can kind of hear them as well whilst you whilst I'm burnishing that. Yeah. And there we go. Nice. Beautiful job, Lydia. Thanks. I'll probably do a little bit more kind of fiddling with that and maybe add some some textures in here or some patterns and stuff like that. But yeah, just playing about really. But that's excellent. That's the, the general gist. <laughs> that is spectacular. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing all of this with us. That looks fantastic. That's okay. Any other I questions have... coming in from, from out there about cull rosing or her pigments or process at all? And you can unmute yourselves and ask. You don't have to do it through chat. Yeah, but... everyone can unmute now. You don't I don't need to be sent to screen anymore. I'm just going back to the um freezer. In Australia, we freeze, I freeze, I've got about three freezers with wood in it because if not, it just dries out too fast here. Yeah. Our, our woods are much harder, I think, too. So. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I, I being, uh, the Welsh weather is very, um, Wet. Uh, generally it's quite damp. Even when it's like sunny, it's, it's not, it's not a dry, dry, do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, freezer. Um, freezer. I think and I take it out, and I can I I can sometimes chop chop it out frozen from frozen. I don't even I thought it. <laughs> That's probably quite nice on a really hot day. If you get hit yeah. with like wood chips, it's quite cooling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So I if I'm so from now on, what I tend to do is like I will. Um, I'll axe out a blank and I'll keep the wood chips from that axing process, which are wet wood, um, and I'll put them in the bag with the spoon blank that I've I've made, yeah. Um, yeah. and then that will go in the fridge, in the bottom shelf of my fridge. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the wood chips that have come off the wood will help to keep the wood damp. Um, I found that's the, that's, that's what's worked best for me, but that's my climate. <laughs> my climate and my wood that I'm using. Yeah, no, I put it, them in bags. After when I'm working on them, I keep them in the fridge. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I found um, so when I do festivals in the summer, like the green gathering or something like that, when I'm teaching spoon carving, I have a cool box which is specifically just for spoon blanks. Um, because obviously in the summer in the UK, it can get quite, quite hot and dry. 
um and so yeah in in those instances as i've done that too like just my, my <laughs> we've got a cool box for food and a cool box for alcohol and then a cool yeah. box for food. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good very important yeah Lydia, somebody else asked about, um, if time allows, would it be possible for you to talk a little bit about the Dolphin Spoon template itself and your, your kind of your process, your profile, like how you go about a carving to that, that, that shape? Yeah. Just, so, uh, just at a high level, obviously, you know, we don't want to get into yeah, it. Yeah. So let me zoom out a bit so I can see everything so um this one is I've, I've seen lots of your um lots of the the spoon challenges on instagram and um i saw one from somebody who was saying about um their their profile was slightly different because of the wood allowance and that that again i you know you have to you have to make compromises on based on the wood that you're using so this is very it, from a very similar situation so this was from quite a narrow um quite a narrow piece of wood to start with and then there was a section of wood here that was just a bit I think it was a bit rotten or it was just a bit soft and so it, it I just took it out completely but you've still I've still got that kind of humped profile mm -hmm. whereas with this one it is much more much more defined so when I'm when I'm carving what I, the first thing I do is I make my billet and then I'll draw this top profile. And I tend to work in flat angles. So the first thing I do is I work very similarly to a bandsaw and I will make sure that this top profile is absolutely perfect um, with a complete straight line downwards. Um, no, no, um, no rounding, nothing. I just make sure that I've got this shape absolutely perfect and then the next thing I do is I turn my blank on its side and I make sure that I've got this side absolutely perfect to how I want it um, and then I've got a flat surface here and a flat surface here um, to then work my rounding from um, and I found that that for me that makes that means that I'm unable to make these beautiful facets even um, and then make these facets as well even. And it just means that my planes of view are, are accurate, if that makes sense. So I, I start with that view, carve that shape out with the ax and then knife it, and then do that view. I ax this shape in as well. I, I'll, I'll ax nearly all of this, if I'm completely honest. Um, and then just, yeah, knife the planes. So when you're putting that crank in, the 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 low point is still that low point as it's shown on the template right right towards the bottom of the bowl yeah like where where the crank is all right but then you've got to allow for that hump so how do you axe down that to get the crank in there without accidentally taking off the hump <laughs> so on the chopping block like that yeah uh i don't have an axe yeah with me. that's all right uh, I axe that way. Gotcha. So I'll axe that. Like, so I'll have this. Uh, so my chopping block stepped. I don't know if you've seen it on Instagram. It's like a stepped chopping block. So it's got chainsawed out steps. So okay. I've got a, a wedge. I've got a, sh a surface there with a back surface here for my spoon to rest against. Got so it. that I can just put my pressure on the top of that spoon and the back bit let me let me do that okay so so i would have my hand like here mm -hmm. on the spoon the back bit would be supported by the chopping block that's on a chopping block okay and i would be able to axe into that section okay yeah like into that section and then i would put it flat on the top of the highest point of my chopping block and act that bit in like that. Got it. If that makes sense. Okay. That was weird being able to see myself on multiple screens at once. <laughs> well, it, it gave us a beautiful view of your Martin Hazel cooks uh, pendant. <laughs> Here we go. He does such lovely work on those. I love them. 
I've got him making um, me one right now. <laughs> very, very pleased with this. It's beautiful. It's got a lovely little bone handle as well with a little yep. copper pin. I asked for exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Any other questions for Lydia? If not, then we will let Lydia go back um, to enjoying her. No, oh, sorry, somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I have a I have a um a friend who's uh, doing linseed oil, and she has gave me a slurry which has like pigments from the linseed inside. So it's like a thicky brown paste, and I wonder if that would work for coal rosing. I mean, I tried it, but I never. I'm not so much into coal rosing. But uh, I don't know if it stays in and stuff like that, but maybe that's a, uh, I don't know. I guess it if would depend want... on whether, is there like actual bits in it, in the oil, or is it the oil itself that's pigmented? No, 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 it's, it's um, um, brown pigments from the linseed. So it's oh, like okay. the husk of the linseed, the, like the ground up fine husk of the, lin of the, of the seed itself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, give it a go. I mean, the 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 beauty of colorizing is you don't have to you don't have to. It's not kind of like spoon carving, and you don't have to make an entire thing. So you can just have like. Yeah. Um, when I teach colorizing, I don't teach people how to colorize onto a spoon. I teach them how to carve onto like colorize onto a shape that looks like um, almost like a big parcel it. label. Um, yeah. So you could just have like a piece of flat wood that you just um, practice your tool marks and tool making on, um, and yeah, and give it a go. That that sounds really interesting. So you have um, how, how do you test test something like that? Like, do you rub it with um, with um, cleaning material from from the dishwasher, or uh, how do you say? Um, or, or do you have any testing? I don't, um, I don't prep. So what I would do is I would literally just have like a, um, uh, say a, a log and I split it into like centimeter, uh, two centimeter kind of flats. Um, and then, um, smooth that surface, um, and like with a knife and then, or a plane and then, uh, burnish that surface. Um, and then that's then ready for you to just scratch away, draw away, make any marks you want to make. Um, and then you can practice different pigments in different section on the same piece of wood. Um, mm. And it's a good way to kind of see how different tools work on the same piece of wood and different pigments work on the same bit of wood um, okay. without you having to make, say, six spoons out of the same piece of wood. You can just have like a little practice. Uh, similarly to how like um, ceramicists have those little palettes of like tests for glazes mm. um it's kind of similar to that really yeah okay yeah or, and or do, do you have any like how do you test uh, how do you wash it off or what what is like really bad oh, for i don't i don't wash it off that's just then a learning curve that's just that's what it is it is a piece of wood that is has taught me how to do that thing um and i have various ones that i've kept for for teaching aids um, to show if i may i think george is asking how do you test that it worked like how do you validate after you wash it and yeah. it doesn't come out oh uh yeah i guess yeah i mean if there's pigment that stayed in the grooves then it's worked you're not gonna then the, the likelihood of the pigment leaving is is highly unlikely but i mean yeah making us making a spoon or having a thing that you use personally so the first the first one of these, um, I don't know if I've got it on there. Aha, now we see the secret of Lydia's call rosing success. One <laughs> sits gonna... not upon a chair, one sits upon a bouncy ball. Yeah, I know, I'm sat on a ball, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> You're gonna see the chaos that is my... Um... I love it. So great, I'll take that one, that one, and that one. <laughs> I know it's terrible. This is so disorganized. Um, it's in prep for moving, you see. Um, oh, I don't have it. This is quite a this is one I did a while ago, so I don't have it. Um, basically, I've still got the very first um, bird coal rosing spoon 
that I ever did. And um, and that spoon has been washed and used. This is a really old one that has been used a lot. Um, and so this just is is a spoon that like I have that I've used lots that I've then tested before then making for sale, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, and I will do the same with uh, these. So this is one of my failures. So actually two of my failures. Um, when I was talking earlier about um, not being precious about stuff, these are two spoons that I made that I really love. Um, and they're a really lovely piece of cherry. They're really nice, really nice kind of crunky shapes, really fun spoons. Um, but I didn't have any others to hand. So I ended up kind of ruining these instead. So this one, I painted the surface first and then I cold rosed it. Um, but because of the color of the paint I used, I don't know if you can see, the, the paint doesn't actually show up. It just makes a dirty surface. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that didn't work. And then this one was a really lovely, actually, Col Rosing, and it's a wraparound as well. So you can see the, I was Col Rosing like a green bean pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and then I painted on top of that and ruined it. So these ones I will keep and I will use and I will wash to see how the coal rosing and the milk paint interact with each other. And then I'll be able to kind of assess how, how they, how they age and whether or not they're viable techniques mm. to use in the future on things that I want to kind of progress for sale, if that makes sense. So that kind of, that, that comes after testing. So I would test on like, um, if I'm testing different pigments, I would test on a flat surface work mm -hmm. out which ones I like, then I test on an actual spoon that I'm then going to use. That will then get washed and used lots. And then it will become a viable technique that I will then try at a later date. So that's kind of how how the kind of cool. Thank you. product testing, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. But Excellent. Some, some ugly failed spoons. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Lydia. This was awesome. Listen, are there any other urgent questions, burning questions that somebody wants to ask? Otherwise, we're going to let Lydia get back to her day because we've already used up like an hour and 20 minutes or so of her time. That's <laughs> um, I just have one really quick question. Do yeah. you have any tips on uh, doing like the end grain? Like if I wanted to put something right in the end here? All right, let me scroll through. Can you, let me. Uh, can you hold up the thing so you're showing? Mirror, yeah. Ah, there we go. Like this ladle right here. Okay. So, yeah. Like, so you could you could give that a go at coal rosing, but you're going to come up across the same problem as if you're coal rosing. Let me. This section. Um, in that you're going to hit lines and you're going to hit sections which are going to have a lot more resistance, um, and do that and then I'm kind of looking at you a bit better so th this section here you can see you've got the the parts of the grain the same with the end grain you're going to hit sections which are much more absorbent and much spongier and so you're going to want to be very careful of how you regulate the pressure of the knife because it's going to be very easy for you to stab in very hard um, jump out a little bit exactly so I wouldn't I personally wouldn't put a really detailed pattern on the end grain because a the end grain is super going to have super absorbent parts where the pigment is just going to stick anyway, mm -hmm. um, and b it's going to be difficult to make a um, a consistent line. So maybe um, like some dot texturing, like the compass idea, or um, oh, yeah. texturing using like the side of a screw to make um, like a dimply texture. Mm -hmm. um, so going for texture instead of like accuracy, I would say something similar to like um, like the spoons, you know, like like a almost like a gestural illustration. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Thank you. Dan Lawrence is a is a is a good advocate for spoon carving play. He <laughs> taught a um, class at the what was it Spoon Fest all about. Um, 
yeah, lack of not to being too precious and playing around with spoon shape and things like that. That was really cool. That mm. is great. I do all the time. Any, anything else? I mean, we can stop the recording and I'll just stay here for yeah. a bit anyway. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. All right, then, uh, for the recording purposes, I thank you, Lydia, so much for your time and your energy and effort in explaining all of this to us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. And yeah. for, uh, hopefully you, you're getting as much out of this as I am. I know I'm going to be going back and rewatching this video a few times. <laughs> so I will uh, do what I can to get this posted up on YouTube, and I will post uh, something on the Instagram for Rise Up about it once I manage to get that accomplished. Uh, so thank you everyone and farewell. And for the rest of you, if you want to stick around once recording stops, feel free. <laughs>